Coming up, we're live in Leicester as police investigate five murders in less than 24 hours. ITV News Central is next. We're live in Leicester tonight at the scene of a fatal house fire in which a mother and her three children were killed. Tonight, police say they're treating their deaths as murder and say the arson attack could have been carried out in revenge for another murder in the city just a few hours earlier. This is ITV News Central. Hello, good evening. This is uh, ITV News Central. We are in the Spinney Hills area of Leicester, where in the early hours of this morning, a fire broke out, which claimed the lives of four people in a house which you can probably see behind me. This evening, they've been named as uh, Shanila Taufik, who was in her 40s, her daughter Zainab, who was 19, and her sons Jamal and Bilal, who were 17 and 15 years old. Tonight, we have uh, three reports to bring you on the programme this evening. Michael Sibbert will have the latest on the fire. Rajiv Popat has the reaction from a shocked community. And Charlotte Grant will be reporting from a short distance from where I'm talking to you at the scene of a murder which is being linked to the events here as revenge is being investigated as a motive for the arson attack. Well, I'll also be speaking live to the local MP who's trying to calm fears in this neighbourhood. But first, Michael Sibbert reports on the fatal fire. Yesterday, this was a family home. Today, it's a burnt out shell. The mother and three children who lived here are dead and the police are looking for their killer. It all started last night. Soeb Ali lives just around the corner from Wood Hill. He told me he could smell burning plastic at around 12.30 and went outside to see what was happening. I came around the corner and I seen people just screaming and saying there's a fire and you can see the the reflection of the heat on all the cars and stuff, like all the other fire and stuff. I just see people just trying to chuck rocks and stones and stuff into the windows trying to break them to let all the smoke out. You can see smoke just coming out, you can smell strong smoke just coming out. And I just ran up this road over here and the first question I asked is everyone out, is everyone out, is everyone out? And they're like, we don't know, we never seen them in the garden. The neighbours like, we checked in the garden to see if they've come out the back, but no one's come out. The family have been named locally as Shanila Tafiq Sattar, who was in her 40s, and her children, Zainab, Jamal and Bilal, aged between 15 and 19. Neighbours told me that their father works in Ireland as a surgeon and comes home at weekends. It wasn't until this morning that people here realised for sure that their efforts to save the family had been in vain. Police recovered four bodies from the house and have been carrying out forensic work for most of the day as part of a murder investigation. The cause of the fire, they say, is suspicious. We're working really closely with the fire brigade. Again, excellent working relationship. Exactly how the, the fire started, where it started, and of course who's responsible is, is something that we'll get to the bottom of. Uh, I have every confidence in the force uh, and in my colleagues uh, to fully investigate these, these terrible, terrible crimes. And of course, really importantly, uh, bring those people who, who may well be responsible, bring them to justice. From first thing this morning, police were refusing to rule out a connection with another murder that happened yesterday afternoon on Kent Street, less than a mile from the fire. This afternoon, they confirmed they were investigating the possibility that this was a revenge attack. The Taufik family were all regular worshippers at the local mosque, just metres away from their home. Tonight, everyone there is praying for answers. Michael Sibbert, ITV News, Leicester. Well, Spinney Hills is an inner city neighbourhood situated in the north of Leicester. It's a diverse multicultural area. I can see the community mosque just a few metres away from where I'm talking to you tonight. People here are trying to understand what happened to a family who were well known and well liked. Rajiv Popat reports now on a community in shock. Prayers were particularly poignant today for worshippers at the Jame Mosque. Inside, Dr. Muhammad Tafiq Sattar was comforted by friends after losing his wife and three children. On the streets of Spinney Hills in Leicester, sadness and shock. Zishin Baswani told me Dr. Tofik Sattar, a surgeon, 
was working in Ireland when he received a call that no husband or father ever wants to hear. Couldn't believe what, what, what was being said to him, so yeah. he, he just went in that state of denial and, and, and he wanted somebody to somebody else also to, to tell him that yes, it has happened because yeah. it's like losing the whole family overnight. They were highly respected and liked in the area. The mother was a scholar and a theologian herself. The older son had studied in a seminary. The younger son and the daughter were studying theology. The daughter was about to graduate within a year's time. So it's a deep sense of loss, not just in the general community, but in the community of scholars and theologians. We feel a tragic loss. Mohammed Mandra was friends with 17-year-old Bilal. He taught history to Jamal, who was 15, just three days ago at a local school. He told me he didn't believe that the family could be the victims of a possible revenge attack. I think it's a mistake and uh, someone just got it at the wrong place. They were very nice uh, little uh, boys and um, very sociable, very nice, and they'd like to go out and do a lot of things. Uh, they were not uh, troublesome people, they were just calm people. They were very studious, they would like to study and they came less to, from Ireland to study. One of Zainab's friends said the 19-year-old was like a sister to her. She's someone who wouldn't look at the bad points, she'd always try to find something good in everyone. I can't believe it. Yeah, I wouldn't want to believe it. She's just there with me, I know that. The deaths have shocked the entire community here. There will now be three days of mourning at the mosque and special prayers will be held tomorrow afternoon to remember the family. Rajiv Poppert, ITV News, Leicester. Well, as we mentioned uh, earlier on, police investigating the house fire believe the deaths may be linked to another murder in the city that happened just a few hours earlier, about a mile away from here. Charlotte Grant has been looking at a fatal beating that may have sparked a revenge attack. This evening, the roads surrounding where Antoine Akpom was assaulted last night are still closed off as police continue to investigate the possible links between his death and the fatal house fire a little more than a mile away. Today, his mother told me that her son had only recently become a father and was a young man everybody loved. She said the family are utterly bewildered by his murder. At the scene where 20-year-old Antoine Akpom was assaulted, flowers for a young man whose life is being cut short far too soon, leaving his family devastated by what's happened. Antoine was a beautiful boy and he just had a young baby and he had a good job. He was a teacher and he was a football coach and everybody loved him. And I just want to know if anybody knows who killed my boy. At 5.30 last night, police say they were met by a large group of people on Kent Street in the centre of Leicester and where they found a young man who'd been seriously assaulted. From the scene, he was taken to Leicester Royal Infirmary where he later died from his injuries. Police say they are still in the early stages of this murder investigation, trying to establish how and why Antoine Akpom was attacked last night. An eyewitness who works locally didn't want to appear on camera, but he told me that he heard shouting and saw a group of 10 to 15 young men walking near the far end of that street. He said he noticed one of the group had a stab wound on his back. He said the police arrived almost immediately, but then he saw that the young man had collapsed by the side of the road. Whether it is linked to the house fire that killed a mother and her three children is a key question for police. Only a matter of hours separates their deaths and the murder of Antoine Akpom. A post-mortem examination is expected to take place later. Police are urging anyone who may have been in the Kent Street area last night to come forward so they can start to resolve the questions Antoine Akpom's family so desperately want answered. Charlotte Grant, ITV News. Well, we're joined live now at the scene by the area's MP, Keith Vaz. Good evening to you, Mr Vaz. Good evening. It's been a quite a traumatic day for everybody involved here. I believe you spent some time in the last uh, few hours with the father of the teenagers uh, killed here, the husband of the woman who died. Well, Dr Tariq uh, al Sutter is clearly in shock uh, following the death of his wife, Shanila, Jamal, Bilal and Zainab. They were the most precious people for him. He was away doing his work as a doctor. He's returned to this tragic news, so he's clearly in shock as is the local community. This is a 
very peace-loving community. Uh, we meet in the shadow of a mosque with schools around us and they're all very grief-stricken by what has happened. I think when you spend the day here, as, as we have, preparing for this programme tonight, you do get a real sense that it is a, you know, a completely normal community. There's utter shock here tonight. Uh, the people that we're talking about who've died were regular worshippers at the mosque. How have people this afternoon started to come to terms with what's happened? I think until they know why this has happened, they will never come to terms with it. And for Dr El Sattar and his friends and family, who all live in the local area, and who worship together, who meet together, they're in and out of each other's houses. Until we get the full facts, there can never be closure. But clearly, there is a, a united spirit in Leicester today in support of this family, because people feel it could have happened to them. And all they want to do is to shower the family, the relatives that are left, with as much love and affection as they can. And unless they do that, I think there can never be closure. A number of relatives are coming from Pakistan. I have spoken to the High Commission there to allow them to come very quickly because obviously they want to all share in this grief together. But at the moment, the community here is in shock. And in terms of that community, like you say, they're in shock. But there's also a little bit of fear around, isn't there, tonight? There has been fear because there are all kinds of rumours as to why this has happened. Leicestershire police have been absolutely superb in keeping elected officials informed, in talking to the community. Uh, there's going to be a police presence around here as there has been all day and I think that should reassure people that they are going to be safe and that is the message that comes out from today. Be calm and be safe. The police are all around and they will make sure that people are protected and people should not uh, take any uh, action at all. They should be aware that they should just wait and listen to what the police have had to say and cooperate because a lot of people have information that could be very helpful. So it sounds a little bit like you're appealing for calm this evening then particularly on the, on the streets around here tonight. Well I think people are calm but I think they are all obviously shocked by uh, what has happened. Uh, as you see this is a very peaceful community, the, the level of crime is, is very low in this part of Leicester but I think that uh, they just want to be reassured and I think the police have done that job extremely well and this is a community that will cooperate, that will seek to provide information and that will assist in any way they can and they want to try and give as much comfort to the family as possible. Mr Vaz, thank you very much for joining us uh, on the programme this evening. Keith Vaz, uh, MP for Leicester East of course. Uh, we're going to have plenty more from here a little bit later on uh, in the programme but for now though we're going to hand you back to the studio for the rest of the day's news. Kate and Steve. Matt, for now, thank you. Time now for the rest of the day's news. An inquest jury has been hearing evidence from the mother of a woman who was found stabbed to death along with her toddler son. Rachel Slack, who was 38, and her 23-month-old son, Auden, were found with multiple stab wounds at her home in Holbrook in Derbyshire in June 2010. Her former partner, 44-year-old Andrew Cairns, also died of stab wounds at the scene. Jane Hesketh reports. The bodies of Rachel Slack, her ex-partner Andrew Cairns and their young son Auden were all found at this house in Holbrook in Derbyshire on the 2nd of June 2010. All three had died of multiple stab wounds. On the second day of the inquest at Derby Coroner's Court, Rachel's mother, seen here in the pink jumper, spent two hours in the witness box answering questions from the coroner, Dr Robert Hunter, in front of a jury. Rachel's mother, Hazel Slack, gave evidence today. She said the first time she realised that Andrew Cairns had mental health problems was when he and her daughter moved into her house in Derbyshire. She said things came to a head when their son Auden was born and he became physically withdrawn. She said he'd sit in a chair all day, sometimes he wouldn't speak to any of them and he repeatedly said he wanted to die. Mr Cairns' sister, Diane Belshaw, seen here in the pattern jacket, also gave evidence today. She said her brother was known to the psychiatric and mental health services in Derbyshire, but shortly before he died, he refused to let them into his bungalow and repeatedly told her he was going to kill himself. She said he looked dead behind the eyes. A few days before she and her son died, Rachel had told Andrew she'd started a new relationship with this man, Robert Barlow, and was pregnant. He's due to give evidence in the next few days. Jane Hesketh, ITV News, Derby Coroner's Court. A 16-year-old girl has appeared in court charged with murdering her newborn baby in Lincolnshire.
The teenager, who can't be named for legal reasons, appeared at Grantham Magistrates Court this morning, accused of murdering the baby earlier this month. She was remanded into local authority care before the case was sent to Crown Court this afternoon. The West Midlands is the worst area in the country for children going to school hungry and almost half of teachers in the region say that it's a problem they see every day. Breakfast clubs are offered by many schools to help alleviate the problem and with more than half of parents here saying they have less money to spend on food than a year ago, it's become a crucial service. Sally Lockwood reports. It costs 75 pence a day to feed a child at this breakfast club in Birmingham. Many families now rely on this service, but a third of teachers in the West Midlands say they've still seen a growing number of children arriving at school hungry. I think it has a huge impact on the children that use, that use our breakfast club. It is open to all our children. It helps out families. It does mean that children can be dropped off at school earlier, lessening stress for the family. It also has a direct impact on our attendance. My mum has to come to work and she can't leave us unattended, so we have to go to come here to have breakfast. My mum goes to college and my sisters go to a different school. Now, if the, your mummy didn't know that you're having breakfast, you will get hungry. New research reveals that three quarters of teachers in the West Midlands believe hungry children have a negative impact on other children's learning. Almost half say they see pupils arriving hungry to school every day and a third of teachers say they've seen a child fall asleep through hunger. Teachers say that children who arrive at school hungry lose up to an hour's learning a day, which amounts to around eight weeks during a child's time at primary school. Breakfast clubs like this help, but just why are so many children arriving at school hungry? Shockingly, it is simply because of poverty. It's because parents in areas of deprivation are not managing to bring food into the house seven days a week on a consistent basis. They're simply running out of money before the end of the week and there are days in the week when they cannot afford to put food on the table for their children. 54% of parents in the Midlands say they have less money to spend on food than a year ago. This primary school says they're aware that some families are struggling. We do offer a breakfast club, but we also have access to a community resource, the food bank. There must be at least 20 families a week that access that resource who haven't got food on the table for the children as a result of complex family issues, benefit changes, um, difficulties with finances. Experts say it's not neglect but poverty that's to blame for a growing number of children arriving at school hungry and families are more reliant than ever on breakfast clubs like this. Sally Lockwood, ITV News, Birmingham. A holidaymaker from Leicester who was hit by a taxi in New York is out of intensive care. Sean Green from the New Parks area of the city was severely injured in the crash and lost a leg. The 23-year-old had just started a holiday when the unlicensed cab driver mounted the pavement and crushed her. Passers-by gave first aid at the scene and health officials say their swift action saved her life. She's now beginning her rehabilitation. A college in Birmingham has been forced to drop a controversial ban on Muslim face veils. Birmingham Metropolitan College originally told students they had to remove all hoodies, hats, caps and veils while on the premises to help with identification issues. The Prime Minister backed the decision, but thousands signed a petition against the ban. The college now says it's decided to modify its stance to allow individuals to wear specific items of personal clothing to reflect their cultural values. The first of 23 trams which will run on the new lines being built to Clifton and Toton in Nottingham have been unveiled. The delivery is part of phase two of the Nottingham Express Transit, which is creating 17 and a half kilometres of new lines and 29 new stations in the city. They've been built by Alstom in Barcelona. You're watching ITV News in the central region, still to come. Leicester star Manu Tuolagi is back at the school where his rugby career first began. And in the weekend weather, mixed fortunes really with the first deep low of autumn moving through on Sunday. And there's more. For all the details, join me a bit later in the programme. Before all that though, time for a final look at some of the historical secrets that are being opened up across the Midlands as part of the Heritage Open Days Festival. Tonight we're in Leicester and we visit the oldest of the three buildings we've shown you. 
Yes, the city's magazine gateway was built in the early 1400s, but it's rarely open to the public. And if you've ever wondered exactly what it was, this weekend is your chance to find out. Callum Watkinson reports. Dominating the historic heart of Leicester, the magazine gateway has had many names and many uses in its 600 year history. This was built around about 1410 and it's part of medieval works of religious precincts and this would be the symbolic um, entrance. Later on, um, after the Protestant uh, Reformation, it came into secular hands. It got its current name in the 1600s. It was used to store gunpowder and at some stage, prisoners of conscience during the great battle for England's soul that accompanied the rise of Protestantism. On the top floor, on the lintel, there's some graffiti in Latin. Now this is evidence that this was possibly used as a prison. In fact, it's in Latin means it's not a prison just for an ordinary criminal. It's somebody who's very well educated. And it says, John Loudon, here by other men's trespass and not his own. But in its early days, it housed important guests and came complete with all the mod cons the Middle Ages had to offer. The many of the estate agents would probably point out the conveniences. So we have two garderobes, which are medieval toilets, which basically is a hole in the floor. That's still more sophisticated than using the river saw. Uh, the one above the other, so you did have to get your, your timing right. Later used by the Leicestershire Regiment as a barracks and museum, a bell they pinched from a temple in Burma still hangs on the second floor. The building's been besieged many times by troops during the civil war in the 17th century and by workmen in the 20th when the Newark underpass drove a dual carriageway beside its very foundations. The tunnel was filled in six years ago, recapturing for the precinct round the gateway something of its medieval serenity. Then religious students would have gathered here on their way to and from the churches in the Newark. Those who run this city in the present are proud of its two millennia of past. The Heritage Open Day is a wonderful opportunity for Leicester to show off its unique 2,000 years of history. We have this year over 30 buildings opening in the city. That's more than ever before. It gets bigger and better and it's an opportunity for us to show off those buildings and to remind people of the remarkable history of this city. It's the type of thing that people drive past or walk past every every day on the way to town or perhaps uh, way to the university and you probably wonder what, what it is and this is a good opportunity to find out what it is and what it was. Oh, absolutely fabulous, isn't it? Well, if you'd like to find out what heritage buildings are open near where you live, log on to our website, itv.com slash central and you'll find uh, a list of them there. Right, it's time now to take a look at uh, the weekend sport and we've got a, a rugby star going back to school. Absolutely. ITV Central Sport Report, sponsored by WeWantAnyCar.com, the Cash for Cars website. Indeed, Leicester Tigers and British Lions star Manu Tuilagi is well known as a high-scoring but occasionally overzealous rugby player. That's a nice way of putting yes. it. Yes. <laughs> well, he puts uh, a lot of where he's got to now down to the place where he had his first lessons, both on the pitch and in the classroom. Back with those who inspired him, both off the field and on it. Manu Tuilagi is one of Leicester Tigers and the British Lions' biggest stars and he returned to John Cleveland College in Hinckley in Leicestershire and it wasn't just to see old and new faces. He was there to coach the next crop of rugby talent. As Manu said, we're going to have players on, uh, space out of the side, aren't we? John Cleveland College is one of the, uh, the top rugby school and uh, you know, I think for me, you know, I'm very fortunate to, to come here. As, you know, some of the boys that came here you know, are now a legend of the game. Although Manu has begun to control his aggression on the pitch, it wasn't long ago he was letting it go a little too far. So was that a problem for Manu the teenager? I had a few words uh, in school games just to watch the late tackles. He was known for the odd, uh, yeah, odd late tackle there and it needed a few words. As for Leicester Tigers, Manu is fit after recovering from a shoulder injury. But the news for teammate Tom Croft is quite the reverse. Having spent a year on the sidelines, he'd returned to great acclaim only to be hit with the news that he faces yet another year 
out of the game. You know, I had a great season with the Lions, and um, you know now he's, he's out for the whole season. So, I mean, I'm glad for him, but you know, for us, you know, it's going to be it's going to be hard to to get someone to replace him. Coping with serious injury is just one side of the game these youngsters have yet to learn about. At their age, all the talk ahead of the school's cup is just about how to be victorious. And training alongside a premiership winning Tiger is a pretty good place to start. Well, football now and Coventry City manager Stephen Presley has told ITV News Central it is his players who should get the credit for the club's impressive start to the season and not him. Yes, despite having been deducted 10 points at the start of the campaign, four wins and a draw from their opening six games have seen the Sky Blues climb off the foot of the table at the expense of Notts County. I have a buy-in from my players. We work very hard on aspects of our play, but you know, a manager's only as good as his players, to be perfectly honest, and there is such an appetite from my players to improve. There is such a buy-in from them for the, the, the style of football that we're trying to play. And... Uh, you know, it should be them that's getting the credit, and I genuinely mean that. Now you see us, now you don't. We're back again at <laughs> tennis, and uh, despite breaking into the world's top 150 following his success in the US Open, Solihull's Dan Evans form deserted him today in the Davis Cup. <laughs> So sad, sad, isn't it? Yeah, he was no match for Ivan Dodic going down his straight sets as Great Britain took on Croatia. GB's hopes of returning to the elite world group are resting on a knife edge. There was some good news because uh, Andy Murray won, and oh. you know, good to have him One back in the Davis Cup it's side good. as well. Yeah. <laughs> well, in a moment, we'll be going back to Matt Teal in Leicester with the latest on that fatal house fire. But first of all, a look at the weather forecast with Emma Jessen. <laughs> Hello there, hope you're ready for the weekend. With a bit of luck you might get a day that looks like this tomorrow but it will feel bitterly cold with a straight northerly flow. Wet and windy however on Sunday with the first deep autumnal low of the season moving through bringing us about 10 to 15 millimetres of rain and some strong winds as well. What's happening then is this is the low that's bringing the rain at the moment. It then slips away to the southeast tomorrow and then it moves back in again on Sunday to bring the wind and rain and then by Tuesday there's a second low that kind of joins up with it. It dumbbells around it and then joins up with it to bring us another messy spell of rain well it would so very unsettled for the next five days and tonight is no exception this evening the heavy rain continues for a while longer it will start to pull away to the east overnight but there'll still be some treacherous driving conditions on the roads even when it stops raining watch out for standing water on the roads and surface spray temperatures well falling maybe lower than nine celsius where you start to get the clearer spells in the west later on as the cloud begins to pull away and break up into tomorrow morning well quite a bright start really but we're in this straight northerly flow so feeling bitterly cold tomorrow the wind starting to get up through the day as well by the afternoon looking much brighter one or two isolated showers around that's certainly the better day of the weekend in terms of brightness wet and windy as i say on sunday 10 to 15 mils of rain expected bright breezy showery on monday and then more in the way of rain and cloud on tuesday bye bye <laughs> Well, that's all from us in the studio this evening, but we can return now to our top story and Matt Teal, who's live for us this evening in Leicester, where police are investigating five murders. Okay, well, thank you. Well, this is a uh, community which is desperately really trying to take in the awful news that a mother and her three children have died in a house fire. You can see the... Uh, seen behind me over my shoulder, Shanila Taufik, who was in her 40s, her daughter Zainab, who was 19, and sons Jamal and Bilal, who were 17 and just 15 years old. It's news which is even harder for their neighbours and friends here in Spinney Hills to come to terms with because police are treating their deaths as murder. Officers believe the house may have been set on fire in revenge for an attack which resulted in the death of a 20-year-old man just a few hours earlier. Antoine Akpom was found about a mile from here with serious injuries and later died in hospital. Police are treating his death too as murder. Tonight his mother told us that she had lost her beautiful boy. He was a teacher and a football coach who'd just become a father to a baby boy. Well, community leaders and the local MP are urging the community to remain calm and have called for peace in this community. We've heard calls for prayer in the last half an hour or so while we've been on air. 
and it is really a community that is struggling to come to terms with the news that has come out today. We will of course have uh, more. The ITV News continues after us uh, with the national and international head news headlines. We're back with the late bulletin at 10.30. Until then, it's goodbye for now.